Okay. Okay, so I want to thank everybody. Everyone's here. Uh, I entitled this presentation, A Tufts Journey to Education Reform. I graduated from Tufts in, uh, in 1991. Uh, but education reform seems to go back slightly before that. Maybe I'm in uh, se seventh grade or something. 1983, uh, President Reagan put out this thing called The Nation at Risk. And it basically said our, our, our schools in this country are, are terrible. And there's this famous quote from it, if an unfriendly power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might well have viewed it as an act of war. So that was a famous uh, quote from that. I was not so aware of this. But then in 1991, uh, Teach for America had started in 1990. So it was brand new organization. And sometime around November, somebody said, hey, there's this thing, you know, Teach for America. It seems pretty good. You're, I was a math major. So, uh, you know, maybe you want to look at that. So I said, OK. And I got in. And in 1991, I went off uh, to, uh, to Teach for America. Now, there's a parallel story going on here, because in 1991 is also when the 53-year-old uh, at the time uh, education historian named Diane Ravitch uh, became Assistant Secretary of Education for uh, George H. Bush. So I'm at Teach for America. She's in the Department of Education in Washington. <laughs> there we go. Now, in Teach for America, we learned that one of the problems is that teachers are bad in the country because they have these low expectations for students. That's, that was a, a big part of the, of the training, that you need to have high expectations. Students will always rise to meet whatever expectations you set for them. So evidently, the regular teachers in this country, for whatever reason, are having low expectations. I mean, how lazy could you be? All you have to do is have these high expectations, and the kid's going to rise to them. And you can't even muster up the energy to just have high expectations. You have to be so uh, down on students in this country. So I said, well, I'm going to go in with, with high expectations. And I taught sixth grade middle school in Houston, Texas, 1991. And I, I struggled, because having high expectations wasn't enough. You couldn't just have high expectations, I learned because uh, my students were getting very confused by my high expectations and by my lack of uh, knowing how to teach a class and how to keep control of a class and how to be organized and, and things like that. So I struggled. And I came to really admire the other teachers in my school, the ones who were the regular teachers, the ones who went through traditional route. They were teaching circles around me. They were doing a really good job. Yes. Uh, and sometimes I'd watch their lessons and say, well, they're, this is kind of easy what they're teaching them. But the students were responding to it. And it took me a while to, to realize that maybe there's a, maybe high expectations is a little too oversimplified of a cure for how to fix schools or how to get people to do better in this, in this country. I taught from 1991 to 1994 in Houston. After my first year, I went to a uh, high school. And I taught there for uh, three years. And I was way better my second year, my third year. Actually, I, I won uh, Teacher of the Year in my, my school, my, my, my fourth year of teaching. I was teaching high school at that time. And I was pretty proud. And I retired from teaching. <laughs> <laughs> so I went off to Colorado. Because what do you do after you retire from Teach for America? At that time, my mind was, you write a book, which then gets made into a movie about the hero uh, teacher who went to the inner city. <laughs> <laughs> so I went uh, to Denver, and I wrote the book. Uh, and uh, I, I, I taught for one more year then. I, I ran out of money uh, writing that book. <laughs> and I, um, and I, I needed to teach for another year. So, so, so I taught for one more year. Uh, did a pretty good job in Denver teaching. And then I retired a second time. And I went and became a computer programmer. Uh, my book got published in 1999 and um, was very proud of that. It never got made into that movie. Um, <laughs> but the book came out in 1999. I really accomplished everything I needed to accomplish in, in education. I taught for four years, one teacher of the year, got a published book. And then I was working for 
the at the time very famous Quark Express, which was at one time uh, the desktop publishing software that dominated the market before Adobe came in uh, and and took all the market shares. But so I was one of the debuggers for Quark Quark Express. So I was a computer programmer, and I was making a lot more money than I was making as a teacher, and my life was you know going. Uh, pretty well. And I decided in 2000, okay, you know what, now that I've got some experienced programming computers, I'm going to go to where I'm from, to New York City. I'm going to get a computer programming job in New York City, you know, maybe Goldman Sachs, that sort of thing. And that's how my life is going to be. Education was a distant memory in my mind. So I moved to New York City and I have uh, several interviews, the last of which occurred on September 10th, 2001, next to the world, in, sorry, next to, in the World Trade Center. If you know your history, uh, you know what happened the next day in that, in that building. So I have my interview at Lehman Brothers, and the uh, World Trade Center uh, attacks occur the next day. And uh, I, I take that as a somewhat of, uh, I don't know, it kind of took the wind, let's say, out of my sales of, of job prospects also, just like it was a bad time. And I was feeling needing something, and a, and a strange thing happened is that I got a phone call, because I was also on the side training teachers as just a thing to do while I was looking for a computer programming job. And somebody, after the Twin Towers thing happened, they, um, they wouldn't go back to Stuyvesant. They said, I don't want to go back. I don't believe the air quality in Stuyvesant is, is healthy. So there was a math teacher opening, and they called me and said, you know, would you like to teach at Stuyvesant? You know, and I'm thinking, well, I'm, you know, like retired from teaching for a lot of years at this point, six years. But for Stuyvesant High School, I said, you know, I'll do it on a temporary basis. And I uh, took a job at Stuyvesant High School in 2002. No Child Left Behind was being signed by George W. Bush around this time. And No Child Left Behind was national law that uh, by the year 20. 14, so 12 years later, every student in this country was going to score proficient on, the, on their state test, 100%. At that time, it was like 35%. So every year, what's the big deal? You just go up 2% a year, 3% a year until you're at 100%, right? Because in Texas, where George Bush was from, they had something called the Texas Miracle, where they claimed that they got their scores up, and their key was testing everybody every year and using the standardized test scores. Uh, the plan was that you can, schools that aren't meeting their goals, they're going to uh, get shut down, turned into charter schools, things like that. Diane Ravitch is still around in 2002. She's now about 63. She writes a book called Left Back, A Century of Failed School Reforms, about how everything that people tried in schools as reform just failed for one reason or another, usually because it got like distorted from its original purpose. Now, uh, in 2002, maybe you remember from looking at the Tufts Daily Archives, it was me who wrote the famous Teach for America Learning About Yourself editorial in the Tufts Daily when I came back to uh, recruit for, for Teach for America. It says something about how, you know, it's the greatest thing I ever did, uh, greatest thing I ever did in my, in my life. Between 2003 and 2008, a lot happened that I was totally unaware of what was going on, though. So I'm teaching Stuyvesant grade school. I'm loving it. I'm teaching. I'm teaching. But around me in New York City, Mayor Bloomberg and his, dep his schools, chancellor, schools chancellor, Joel Klein, are there. They're shutting down schools. They're opening charter schools. They're saying the teachers union are, are, are evil. All this is going on. I'm oblivious to it because I'm teaching, happy, my life is going great again. Uh, Hurricane Katrina happens. Uh, eventually, Arnie Duncan says that he was Secretary of Education under Obama, says that that was the greatest thing that ever happened to New Orleans because uh, it, it allowed them to uh, turn all their uh, schools into charter schools. Um, Michelle Rhee uh, started to rise. Michelle Ree was a Teach for America alum. She was 1992 Teach for America. I knew her back in the day in 1996 when I was a trainee. I worked for the Institute and she was like my supervisor and I did not like her. 
she, I did not find her to be smart. I did not find her to be empathetic. I did not find her to really have any qualities that I liked. And she and I uh, got into arguments about a lot of things. These two guys on the left and right of George W. Bush are Dave Levin and Mike Feinberg. They were Teach for America in 1992, which is a year after me. They were in Houston with me, and I knew them well. They started the KIPP uh, charter school chain. Uh, charter schools were really liked a lot by Republicans, and Dave Levin and Mike Feinberg were actually at the uh, like the convention, the Republican convention, like in like a featured spot. So it's interesting with Republicans liking really. Um, no child left behind was bipartisan. K uh, Ed, Ted Kennedy uh, was one of the main sponsors of it. So we got this, uh, Ed, this agreement among Republicans and Democrats that schools are really bad in this country. Uh, over here at the same award ceremony is Wendy Kopp, founder of Teach for America, who I, uh, I knew somewhat. In 2009, you get President Obama. He hires his old basketball playing buddy, Arnie Duncan, who was at one point CEO of schools in Chicago, uh, despite really having any experience in education. Never taught. He tutored, I think, a bit. His mother was something with, uh, had a, some kind of program. And there on the bottom right, you've got Obama signing the famous Race to the Top. So Race to the Top was a grant. There was $4 billion, and they said, okay, you want, you want some of this money? You've you got to apply first. And if you have any chance of getting this money, your state laws better say that there's no charter school cap and it better say that your teacher evaluations need to be somehow based on taking standardized test scores and figuring out who the best teachers are in a very objective way using test scores and not through like a principal watching the teacher, but using the test scores to, to figure out who the, who the best teachers are. It didn't matter that they had not yet perfected a way of taking these test scores and turning them into teacher ratings. But uh, nonetheless, they signed this and states around the country changed their laws to have these things in them, to have, have a chance, and race to the top happens. In 2010, the movie Waiting for Superman happens. And by the way, all this time, I'm living my life so happy not knowing about any of this stuff. It's kind of in, in my periphery. Oh, Dave Levin, he's, he's on TV. Great, I knew him. Oh, Michelle Reed, I didn't like her. You know, but I didn't really... It, it didn't mean anything to me. It was just going on in the background. Any social studies teachers would have said this. He's a math guy. Right. I was, I was living life. Waiting for Superman comes out in 2010. Michelle Rhee, she, um, she was chancellor of Washington, D.C. schools, very controversial. She left and got her deputy put in to do the same stuff, but just in like a nicer way. Um, Bill Gates funded, a, put a lot of money into all this stuff, especially the teacher evaluation and how to measure teachers by the, these test scores. And they're all on Oprah together. Michelle Rhee left, she wasn't chancellor anymore. The mayor that she was appointed by got voted out, so uh, she, she resigned. But then she started something called Students First, which was such a great name. Uh, it <laughs> basically says, you know, there's two sides. There's people who want to put adults' interests first or people who want to put students first, and what side are you on? And, you know, it's really hard to say, well, I'm on the adult interest side. Uh, <laughs> Bill Gates is big, that's the director. He directed uh, um, the big, the uh, environmental one, uh, Inconvenient Truth, Davis Guggenheim. So Waiting for Superman comes out, and it causes a big splash. NBC has Education Nation, all this stuff. So it says that U.S. has fallen behind other countries that we're like 27th in math and 35th in reading, um, that charter schools are the answer. They, sh they, they show six charter schools, and they show how great they are and how they're closing the so-called achievement gap. And the big problem, they say, is that you can't fire teachers. Charter schools, you can fire teachers. And they're getting these great test scores. The only difference between the charter school and the regular school is that the regular school, you can't fire the teacher. So of course, that's the problem. And if we can only fire these teachers better, more easily. And they have some economists who come on and say, if we could just fire the bottom 5% of teachers, it will add $1 trillion to the economy. 
Uh, that's an actual thing. Um, <laughs> so that's waiting for Superman. Again, I'm still not really paying much attention to this. Oh, here's my favorite line from Waiting for Superman. For generations, experts tend to blame failing schools on failing neighborhoods, but reformers have begun to believe the opposite, that the problems of failing neighborhoods might be blamed on failing schools. So this is a quote, actual quote, narrator says in, in this movie. 2010, Diane Ravish is still around. She's 73 at this point. Um, she wrote a book called The Death and Life of Great American School System, which says that charter schools are not doing quite as well. There's a lot of false promises. There's a lot of lies. Um, it's not working. She was one of the key people to say that charter schools are an important thing. Okay, she was an early advocate for years and years, and she said, you know what? I just realized, you know, I was wrong for the last 20 years. What I've been saying, maybe in some sort of theory it could work, but the way it did turn out, it's actually worse in making things worse. She wrote a big review of uh, Waiting for Superman. I, on my blog, I started writing a blog before this about, like, just teaching advice, but then I started getting a little political. I wrote my first sort of thing about... Uh, Waiting for Superman movie and my impressions of it. But for me, it all starts in 2011, the 20-year Teach for America anniversary summit. And I go there. I figure I'm like some kind of hero. I've been te I'm teaching again 20 years. I've been there for 19 of the 20 years. I know all these people. And there's this love fest of Waiting for Superman type stuff. There's Michelle Reed, Dave Levin, Jeffrey Canada. They're doing a, a reunion panel of Waiting for Superman. Uh, and the whole conference is all about charter schools and how great they are and how they're closing the achievement gap. And I know these people, you know, and they're liars and they're not very smart. And, <laughs> and to make it worse, they're rich now and they're famous. <laughs> and now it's personal because they're taking the attention I was supposed to be getting at this <laughs> conference. <laughs> so I'm starting to like fume throughout this five day conference. And it culminates when Arne Duncan takes the stage at the end and makes a speech about how tough it is to, how it's hard to make some of the tough decisions like shutting down schools. But as proof that it was the right thing, Englewood High School in, uh, in Chicago, he says, we shut it down, we owned up a charter school, and now that charter school is having its first graduating seniors, and 106 out of 106 students graduated, uh, and 106 out of 106 got into four-year universities. And he said, it's same kids, same building, only difference was adult expectations, and it made all the difference. And everyone went crazy, because that's pretty amazing. The same school to turn it from what some people used to call like a dropout factory into this incredible experience. And I left that thing, and on the way home, a friend of mine, um, what's that? A friend of mine gave me that Diane Ravitch book, uh, Death and Life, sort of reading it on the train. Sort of saying, hmm, this is all coming together. So I wrote a letter to Diane Ravitch, February 15, 2011, and said I um, investigated this thing that Arnie Duncan just said. And what I found is that while it might be true that 106 seniors graduated that school, uh, there were once 180 kids in that school when they were in ninth grade. So to imply that uh, they had a 100% graduation rate just because 106 seniors uh, became 106 graduates, that's just ingenuous. And I also found that their test scores were like some of the lowest in the entire city. Only 10% of their students had passed the uh, standardized test. So I wrote her, scheduled for this blog, so she wrote me back quickly and said, this is great. Uh, you know, you mind if I publish your letter? And can I do something with this? And over the next couple of weeks, she wrote, which became a really seminal thing in uh, the New York Times editorial that said, uh, op-ed saying, waiting for a school miracle. About, she picked three schools, one that I had analyzed and two others, and showed how politicians were lying to prove that shutting down schools is a good thing because they need these data points of like magical, we, we, she called them, uh, she, she, she called waiting for a school miracle. As you can see, there I am uh, in the New York Times saying about how, uh, how that, that, that I debunked these, these claims. And I became the debunker. It was, <laughs> it was really hard. Um, but I had to, I, something made me like keep on, I, I just got the, the energy to just 
do these blogs and do them. And then, and, and I, I know Steve had, had sent you, this was sort of uh, a big moment for me, this um, blog post I wrote, because Teach for America was part of this whole thing. Teach for America had a symbiotic relationship with education reform. They love Teach for America because it proves how bad regular teachers are. If these Teach for America teachers in four weeks, five weeks of training could be just as good, if not better, than, uh, than these veteran teachers, that must be a proof how bad the regular teachers are. Plus, the Teach for America teachers, they don't like to take like the, the slow way of becoming an assistant principal and working your way up. They like to just quit, become a principal of a charter school, and just you know, cheat uh, and lie about who their students are you know, and, and, and lie about their attrition rates and things like that and their test scores and, and their discriminatory policies of who gets into the school or how to different, the different tricks for discouraging the wrong people from applying to your charter school or from accepting your offer to get into the charter school. So I wrote this thing about why I did TFA and why you shouldn't. And um, uh, you, you, I think you, you read it. It was uh, very dramatic uh, <laughs> with the last line. If I were America, I would say, go teach for someone else, uh, <laughs> which I was real proud of. Uh, that, that, that's, that's a good line. <laughs> That got me on to NPR. <laughs> I, got a, I went to a studio that was like the size of like myself, basically, with like giant headphones on and a microphone. And I, I talked on NPR about this. And uh, I was getting the attention I deserved as a Tufts, you know, person. <laughs> OK, now a couple of things that I accomplished on the blog. In 2011, a Teach for America guy named Kevin Huffman became, uh, became uh, education commissioner for Tennessee, which won Race to the Top money. Kevin Huffman was Michelle Rhee's ex-husband. Uh, he becomes commissioner. He hires this guy named Chris Barbick, who was a real, he was actually a really good friend of mine. I actually do like Chris Barbick. He was uh, at Teach for America 1992. He started the Yes Prep Charter Schools. He was hired to become the head of something called the ASD, the Achievement School District. That was modeled after, after the RSD, the recovery school district, which is what uh, New Orleans became. All the schools became these charter schools. So ASD modeled after the RSD. But the ASD had a, this was their marketing thing. We at the ASD uh, are proving the poss possible by uh, moving the bottom 5% of schools in Tennessee to the top 25% within five years. So they're going to have five years. They're going to get the schools from the bottom 5% into the top 25%. And, and everyone says, great. Take over whatever schools you want in the bottom 5%. Well, uh, that sounds like a great plan. And I write to him, because they're going to take over existing schools, not do like a charter school lottery thing, but like take an actual school. So this is going to be, I'm interested in this. This is, this is going to like prove whether charter schools are cheat or not. So um, I wrote a series of open letters, 16 of them actually. And um, one of them was to Chris Barbick. And I said, it's not going to work. <laughs> It's not going to work unless you cheat, but it's not going to work. Um, and I started following the Achievement School District over the years. And after two years, there's a big article saying that it's working and that two of the six schools were on track to get, out of the bottom, to, get to the top 25% within four years instead of uh, five even. So I'm tracking them because I have a lot of patience. We'll get back to him in a second. At peak of education reform in 2013, there are 10 prominent Teach for America people uh, in education reform. Cami Anderson, John White in Louisiana, Michelle Ree, Kai Henderson took over from Michelle Ree, Dave Levin and Mike Feinberg with KIPP, Kevin Huffman, Commissioner of Education, Chris Barbick, Mark Sternberg is high in New York City, Michael Johnson is a state senator in Colorado, Wendy Kopp started Teach for America. So there, and Teach for America is like, they're embedded with this reform movement, and I have this unique skill, or, or actually set, I would call it a skill, but a set of knowledge because I'm an alum, that I'm in the perfect person in this anti-reform movement to sort of combat them. So here's something, you know, you, uh, schools, uh, we're losing place in, uh, against other countries, that's, that's what they say. But the first ever competition between countries was in 1964 and on that one the United States came in 11th out of 12 so 
So the FIMS test, we were 11th out of 12. So we were almost dead last in that one. Now we're, we're you know, sort of in the middle. But take a look. You can actually see that, yes, OK, so maybe we're 27th in reading. But come on. It's like a tie for third or something. I mean, I mean <laughs> it's, it's really not. It's not so bad. It's, it's, it's like coming in fifth place in the Olympics or something. I mean, are you really that different from the other schools? So I, so, so I would analyze uh, data of this uh, sort. Now, there was a very famous, um, very famous study. So the, 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 the attempt to take standardized test scores and use them to figure out how good this teacher is or how good that teacher is. It's hard, because if I have a student who's a really high-performing student and they do well on the test, and you have a low-performing student and they do poorly on the test, you know, who's better? Maybe if we switched places, I would have gotten a higher score out of your kid and you would have gotten a lower score. You know, it's tough to say. So in the early 1990s, someone named William Sanders in Tennessee, who was a, he, he did stuff with like, agriculture like beans and what's the best like fertilizer for beans uh, but he used his process to to uh, measure teachers and they call it the uh, TVA and in it they showed that if you have three consecutive effective teachers these are three groups of students like in 1993 and this is this these are the students after three years with three ineffective teachers this is the same group with three medium teachers or two two four out of five and this is the same group with three expert teachers. So you can see the difference between three consecutive. And that was, this was a thing Michelle Reed used to say a lot. If three consecutive teachers, research shows if three consecutive teachers. So I researched this. And I found the data, the actual raw data, which is hard to find. And I remade the graph showing that, yeah, sure, if you take, if you take this bar, this bar, and this bar, it seems to prove that. But if you see all the bars, it suddenly shows that most of, the, um, most of the combinations of teachers didn't have much of a difference at all. So it's just interesting to see how like, different data is taken out of context. New York City, there was a lawsuit, uh, some, uh, a, 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 not a lawsuit, but a Freedom of Information Act, where they had to publish all the teacher uh, value-added data. So and everyone was against this. I said, I, I said, this is great. I'll be able to use this data to prove what garbage it is. <laughs> this graph, which looks like a bunch of random dots, this is a graph of teachers who taught two different grades. So someone taught seventh grade and eighth grade. So they got two different scores that year. They got a, how good of you, how, how good of a seventh grade teacher are you, and how good of an eighth grade teacher are you. So they should be around the same grade. If I'm the best seventh grade teacher, I should be a pretty good eighth grade teacher also. But what this graph is showing, whereas we should see some kind of a linear relationship, we have this person's the best seventh grade teacher, but the worst eighth grade teacher. <laughs> and this person's the worst eighth grade teacher, but the best seventh grade. So this, what should have shown, if there was any validity to the way they're using test scores to evaluate teachers, this thing would have to show a linear correlation. And there's no correlation, because the way they do it is garbage. It's not statistically valid. You know, and I should make a quick side note that when I make my own tests at, at Stuyvesant High School, um, if my students do poorly on it, I do look at it and say, oh, I must have, I, should, I need to spend more days on this next year. I do think that a test is a valid thing, a good test. And uh, especially when the teacher makes it. But the tests that they're using are not good. The way they're grading them, the, the way they like, decide who's in the zoo. Everyone gets around the same grade is basically what happens. So then they have to say, OK, but the, someone's worst, so let's give them a 0. And let's give this other person 100, even though all their scores were almost the same. They don't want to say all teachers are the same. Um, now, all teachers aren't the same, but these test scores actually almost would make you, that's actually the better conclusion. It's not true either. Ah, Teach for America, they love to, um, to lie about their greatness. <laughs> so a study came out that said that Teach for America math teachers teach 2.6 months more than other teachers. And uh, you hear this a lot. This school has two months of learning. I said, how do they measure that? How do you measure months of learning? Like, what do you, this, how does that work exactly? So I went and read the paper that it was based on. And I saw this. 
it said they were hired by 0.07 standard deviations. That's very small. Just, just so you know, a full standard deviation, like 60, it, 0.07 standard deviation is very small. Let's just say that. <laughs> it's basically like getting a 700 on the SAT versus a 710 on it. It's like one question on a test. It's like one question on most tests would be 0.07 standard deviations. And they even say here that the Teach for America people went from the 27th percentile to the 30th percentile. This difference also translated into an additional 2.6 months. So I said, how do you get that? They said, well, point two, I, I emailed the, the people who did the study. They said uh, one year of learning is 0.24 standard deviations. Uh, I said, how could that be? You're saying if someone, so basically what they're saying is that people don't learn hardly anything. So if you learn 10% uh, or 26% more, that's 2.6 months, because 10, 10 months in a year. Anyway, anytime you see 2.6 months, the conversion factor is complete nonsense. In fact, you see some schools that get like an additional three years of learning in one year. Because one standard deviation would be four years of learning. And 15% of people on any normal distribution get one standard deviation or more. So 15% of people learn four additional years in one year. And 15% learn four less years in one year. So <laughs> They're ready to go. Four years in one year. Um, so I wrote a, since I was a TFA math teacher, I wrote this blog post about that. <laughs> now, there's a lot of hysteria in ed reform. And they're very smart. They, they're very rich. And they have, like, consultants that tell them, like, slogans and things, students first, things like that. So here is a big one. 143,000 New York City kids trapped in failing schools. They, they decided that they, they, they said these schools are failing because they have low test scores. Not, uh, there's, there's a lot of reasons for low test scores. We'll talk about those after. But are these people trapped? Well, I went to the school surveys and found that like 90% of the parents in the school answered the question, would you recommend this school to your friends? They said, yes, they would. So I just have trouble with the word trapped. It's a great word to picture this burning school and the kids are trapped in it. But... <laughs> In reality, I wrote, so I wrote about an overwhelming majority of 140,000 in failing school recommend their school to, to others. So if you're trapped in a school, you don't say, I mean, unless you really mean, come on in here with me. It's great. You just don't do it. Uh, my favorite post of all, and I, so usually I get like into something for like a month and then I like lose interest. That's just how I, how I am. Uh, so this was going on for like years, and you could see from my blog post that I had a lot early on, 10 a month, 20 a month, and I started to really s slow down. I started to get kind of burned out on it, to tell you the truth. And fortunately, uh, other people were starting to join in in the education reform uh, fight. But my like magnum opus was open letter to Arne Duncan, where I uh, took his basketball season from Harvard in 1986. <laughs> and use value added to prove that he was an ineffective coach, uh, ineffective uh, team captain, because he was the captain. That required going to the Harvard Crimson archives and reading up on every single basketball game that was played that year. So I could really say, what about this guy that you played against and he stole the ball from you in quarter three, you know, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> this is a great post. I mean, uh, some, I, I've wavered between being really proud of it because it took like four months and being really ashamed of it, because <laughs> why would anyone spend four months mastering the Ivy League basketball season of 1986 so they could make some kind of point? Uh, so, uh, but it's really, it's pretty funny. It's a good post. Diane Ravitch, my buddy now, she writes <laughs> Reign of Error. Uh, and in this one, I'm actually in the book as a character and... In the acknowledgments, uh, which is really something to me, considering, and this was actually before Jennifer was outed, ousted herself as Edu Scheister. And this is when I figured out who she was, because I didn't know either. And when I saw that, I'm like, Jennifer Berkshire. Uh, then, and then I like did some searching, and that was when I, that's how I discovered. Then, then, then she uh, eventually. Uh, uh, revealed herself to everybody. Everyone thought it was a man because her picture had a man on it. So that was the first surprise. Uh, 
So here are the reformers. Let's just look at them. We got Bill Gates, the Waltons, billionaires. We got Democrats and Republicans, Rahm Emanuel, Bloomberg, uh, Duncan, Ree. By this time, uh, by, by, by 2015, we have a small but scrappy group of uh, resistors. And we have no name, because they took the word reformer, which is a great name. Like, we're anti-reformers, what does that mean? We don't, you know, they call us the status quo defenders, which isn't true either. We don't even have a name. Anti-reformers, reform critics, here we are. Okay, so here's the, here's the reform <laughs> critics. People who you don't know, I'm in there. You got, you got, you got about six bloggers. Mercedes Schneider, Arthur Goldstein, Jennifer, Jersey Jazzman, Mark Weber, me, Peter Green. You got a few people who are heads of sort of organizations and things. You got time. That's us. Now, so I, so I went to Tufts. I'm not sure where these, Jennifer, where did you go to college? I'm from the heartland. I went to Eastern Illinois University. Okay, Eastern Illinois. So we have people, and, and Ravitch went to uh, w Wellesley. Yeah. Right? So it's sort of like, uh, now these people, well, a lot of them went to Harvard. Uh, Michelle Ree, Duncan, Obama, Bill Gates for, for a time. You know, it's, it's, it's obvious why the Harvard people would want to this education reform. They think test scores are everything because they have got high SAT scores. They can never admit that they're wrong. You know, the truth is that education reform is not teachers' unions versus reformers. It's not Democrat, most Democrats and Republicans versus a small group of Democrats. But at the heart of it, education reform is a battle between Harvard and Tufts. <laughs> <laughs> and as you go out into the world, you'll have to decide which side you're on. <laughs> so in 2016, after five years of building up to fight against these uh, people that I didn't like who were so uh, popular in 2011. I go to uh, the 25th year anniversary summit is coming up. But you know, I've been training for this one, right, for five years. <laughs> and I wrote to them two years ahead of the, the thing. And I said, it, could there be like a panel discussion, you know, debate, you know, I'd like to participate in that. I have been teaching now for almost 20 years. And you know, I have, I've, I've written, uh, I had about six books out by this time and different things. Maybe I could qualify. They said, well, we haven't started doing it yet. And then like six months later, hey, I'm just getting back to you, following up. And he said, oh, it's too late. We already booked everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I was not permitted to be on a panel discussion of any sort. But I got the last laugh when the Washington Post contacted me and said, could we shadow you at this thing? And the only article on Teach for America's 25th Summit He's the stinkweed at the Teach for America garden party. <laughs> so, so, so I got the last laugh uh, and got some attention that I needed. <laughs> okay, so since 2016, I did slow down a bit, but I want to tell you about some of the favorite like, things that happened. So Kip High School was ranked fourth in New York State by the 2017 US News and World uh, Report. And this bothered me for a bunch of reasons. First of all, I went to that KIPP school. Frank, one of my great memorable students. Come on and have a seat, if you can. Good to see you, Frank. I wrote his college recommendation letter <laughs> and said, I, I, as a Tufts alum, uh, I can tell you that he is Tufts material. <laughs> That's why you only got into Tufts, because that's the same one I use for all the, for all the schools. No. Now, there's, so Kip High School, first of all, Stuyvesant was ranked like 12th on this list uh, in New York City, New York State, and Kip is fourth? There's no way Kip is better than Stuyvesant High School. So I, so I looked in, why is this? And, oh, and also, I went to Kip. I, some, very not, some, some guy invited me who thought that once I saw Kip in person, I would come around. So I went to Kip. They invited me. And they said, just you know, go around wherever you want, do whatever you want. And what I saw there was this, this school's not good at all, right? I'm, I'm going, I'm seeing just, I went to a school, a class that was called Study Skills. And I guess 
they didn't know about my reputation or whatever. And I guess I kind of blend into the woodwork because there was six students and a teacher and, I'm, and me. And they're doing study skills and the teacher's like, okay, if, if you do one of your six homeworks tonight, tomorrow you get a candy bar. You know, and the kids are all high-fiving, just one home. It, this school, I saw so many. So I wrote 10 blog posts about my visit <laughs> to, uh, to Kip. <laughs> and I saw so many things in there, you could read those. But I said, something's wrong with this. Something is wrong. And the first thing is that Kip Academy Charter School is not a high school. It's a middle school. And that's odd to me, because the high school is called something else. Then I look and see the other four middle schools are also U.S. ranked, but they don't, have, they, they don't get ranked. They don't have high rankings. I said, this is really weird. Why is this middle school the number fourth high school in New York <laughs> State? Why is their high school not on the list at all? And why are there other schools on there not ranked? So I investigated, investigated, and found out that this middle school had 87 students, all that took the AP test and passed it. The other schools had zero people take the AP test. So I said, something fishy about this. Basically, they assigned only the kids who passed AP tests to this fictitious middle school. that they, they had a middle school, but they said the middle school was a high school. So they could get one school where everyone, because the only thing on US News World Report is AP passing rate. So they separated their students into four schools unofficially so that one school could be highly ranked on the US News and World Report, and the other three wouldn't get ranked at all. So I revealed this, and six months later, they were off. <laughs> they, were, they were kicked off the US News and World Report. So that was uh, whether <laughs> due to discrepancy in data reporting, the data original. So that, was, that made me proud to have uncovered that. <laughs> Tennessee, they had a, they had a five-year plan to get the bottom 5% of schools to the top 25%. Uh, after five years, though, something glitched in their testing happened. Uh, so, they could, so they got an extra year, six years. But I have patience. So after six years, I scoured the data. And their schools, five of the six were still in the bottom 5%, many of them in the bottom 2%. And one made it to the bottom 8.2%. But no, no schools made it to the top. And Chris Barbick, he, he resigned and uh, got a high paying job for the John Arnold Foundation. But the holy grail of Ed Reform is Success Academy, <laughs> Ava Moskowitz. She started in 2006 with kindergartners and first graders, and she's been building up a network of 40 schools in New York City. And unlike the other schools, whose test scores are only marginally better, if, if that, than the regular schools, her test scores are really great. Now, they have recently had some problems, like uh, a hidden camera where a teacher was ripping up a kid's, uh, a kid's math paper and telling her to go to the, uh, what is it, the calm down corner. I think I, I think I have that video. Yeah, I'll just, you can imagine it. <laughs> she, she, the, 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 the little docile kid who made a math question, but made a mistake. Um, they also came out that they had what's called the got to go list which means uh, a list of students that they want to kick out of the school. It, it came out that they had the got to go list. Um, so they, there was just this one video and they said, oh, that's really an anomaly, this video. Our teachers are very kind. Um, so I found a collection of 500 videos they posted. They were their training videos for their teachers. Uh, I don't know if they were supposed to be publicly posted, but I, I found them. They, they were publicly posted, maybe by accident. And I wrote about, what I thought was more abusive than the, than the rip and redo video. And this was their training video. Like the, what I saw this teacher doing was like just so hostile, the way of, 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 of reading a simple story to kids with needing to control every movement that they made. So I posted about the Circle Time at Success Academy and they, they took down all 500 uh, videos from their public website. So, they just have their first graduating class happening. And this big celebration. After all these years, kids are graduating. And they all got into college, all 17 of them. <laughs> of course, there were 73 students back when they started. And I did an analysis of who graduated. And it was mainly girls. It was mainly kids who were not on free lunch. Only 24% of the kids who started who were free lunch graduated, whereas 70% uh, of the kids who were not. So I wrote, who survives? 
uh, success. So Success Academy, very secretive, very famous, but you know, basically uh, cheaters, liars, and things like that. Now, now, remember I said in 2013 was the reform peak? Not so good anymore. <laughs> Eight of those 10 people are no longer in power. They've been resigned, fired, resigned, 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 resigned. By the way, they don't feel bad for them. They all have high-paying jobs doing other things. Uh, his, his term ended. He's running for governor right now. He had a sexual scandal with a student. Wendy Kopp is head of uh, Teach for All, which is Teach for America for around the world. So now there's only two of them left. Here's some good things that have been happening recently. So the, the pendulum has been swinging in the other direction. Not just because, you know, I, I, was a, a, I was a person who was part of a very small movement. I wasn't the most important person, but I served a role because I knew math well and I could analyze stuff. And I had, you know, an ax to grind with some of these people, whatever it was. <laughs> but these things, Massachusetts, they voted down the charter school uh, cap raising. Bill Gates comes out and says, oh, teacher evaluation efforts haven't shown results <laughs> just recently. Reformers are now suddenly saying, oh, test scores, they're not that important. If the parent likes the school, parental choice is more important than test scores. Strikes, not just in West Virginia, but right now in Oklahoma and Kentucky. Court case in California to take away teacher tenure uh, failed. Two, one more slide or two more. Hmm. Hold on a second, I'll go this way. DC had a scandal for graduation rate. They're passing kids who don't deserve to pass, who don't come to school, yet they pass them all to make their graduation rates look good. These are all in the last like months. Uh, almost uh, Supreme Court, because of Scalia dying, there was a tie that would have taken away unions' ability to charge uh, mandatory fees. And just yesterday, Rick Hess, who's a big reformer, but he's, he's I like him. He, there's there's a, one or two of them that are like, one or two of them are saying, listen, if we're not getting the results, we, we need to try the next thing. He says uh, school choice supporters should drop the overheated rhetoric. Uh, but things are not all that rosy. There's a new Supreme Court case likely to go against the unions that they're not going to be able to uh, charge mandatory fees. Students First doesn't exist anymore, but there's something called the 74 and 50 can, an education post that write propaganda. Michelle Rhee met with Trump. She was offered uh, Secretary of Education, but turned it down. But yeah, yeah, but she, she could, she's, she's keeping a low profile. Her husband was mayor of Sacramento. He had a sex scandal with teenagers. So she's keeping a low profile, but she'll be back. Michelle Rhee, don't never count her out. <laughs> and Arnie Duncan, just yesterday, people are saying education reform hasn't worked. Don't believe them. So uh, the fight does continue. Here's me and Diane Ravitch finally meeting in person and uh, getting a picture. She's now 80, and she's writing her next book about uh, the victories of the education reform critics. OK, so that's my presentation. Now, I'll, by the way, what class ends at what time? Uh, 11.45. So oh, great. So there's time for questions. Uh, but if, uh, that's, that's my story. See, only, only uh, Harvard people with money can be countered by very poor, but Tufts graduates. That's the <laughs> moral of the story. <laughs> okay, so some questions? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.